All right, now in the last video, we kind of went through some of the, the first core areas of uh, psychology and a little bit about the history of it. Um, here where we're going to pick up is something that's probably a little more familiar to you. Perhaps you've even seen a version of this um, figure here or you've at least heard of it. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a pretty well-known concept. Um, I, I can tell you that in like academic circles where people are doing research on um, high-level psychological principles, Maslow's a little bit out of vogue. But that's only if we're really trying to understand how human behavior works. I think as a concept, there are a lot of pieces of Maslow's hierarchy that are actually still really useful. But to summarize, if you haven't ever seen this, um, Maslow was, he was kind of a clinician in a way. Um, he was trying to understand sort of core human needs in order to help with some of his therapeutic techniques. And to do that, he developed this hierarchy. And so the concept is you have to, just like you're building a pyramid, um, like here in front of you, you have to start at the bottom, the foundation, before you can move to the next level. You can't skip a step. So the first level of human needs are these physiological needs. So you have to satisfy the physiological needs of a person before you can move up to higher level things. A person has to have food, they have to have water, shelter, warmth, they have to feel comfortable. Their basic physiological needs have to be taken care of. Now, those have to be taken care of before a person can have any sense of security, whether it's safety or employment or having some um, financial resources. If a person has all of those things and they don't have food or shelter, then they're still going to be a mess. Uh, once the first two are taken care of, then you can meet a person's social needs and then their esteem. And then at some point, um, Maslow believed if all of these things are taken care of, you've, you know, you've got food and water, you've got employment, you're making decent money, you've got friends and you feel accomplished, then you can have this level of inner fulfillment that he called um, self-actualization. Now, if you follow um, you know, any world religion, sometimes people kind of equate this to you know, a state of nirvana it's not quite that. Um, it's more of just, it's completely internal. You feel completely at peace um, with the things you have done in your life. And the way that Maslow described this is we kind of fluctuate in and out of self-actualization. And it wasn't like a state that you reached where you stayed there the rest of your life. Let's say that you do really well and you reach self-actualization when you're like 40 you're not going to be self-actualized for the rest of your life just because you've reached it. You would fluctuate in and out of it, even though you might stay really high on this pyramid. So Maslow's concept of hierarchy of needs is still pretty useful. Um, if you're thinking about, you know, understanding why someone behaves the way they do, you can think about where they are on this pyramid. Um, have their basic needs been met, their physiological needs? If so, have their security needs been met? And if, if any of those haven't, you can kind of, you know, reverse engineer why they're behaving the way they are. Um, and it's actually really helpful, very fascinating. Um, something that I am a big fan of just because I'm a cognitive psychologist is this event called the cognitive revolution. So really quickly, in the early part of the 20th century, really all the way up to around the 1950s, um, behaviorism was heavily in vogue. And we're going to talk about this a lot when we go over human learning. But behaviorism was the thing. So going back to Watson and B.F. Skinner, Behavior was what we studied. We don't really care about the human mind or mental processing because we can't study it. It's this intractable thing that we can't study. I can't lift the top of your head off, peer inside, and see like what your mind is doing. It doesn't really work that way. Um, but in the 1950s, and really in the 1960s, things started to change pretty drastically. Um, a lot of this came about because of advances in 
computer science, neuroscience, um, linguistics. And a key figure in this is someone by the name of Noam Chomsky. And I believe Noam Chomsky is still alive. He kind of became a, a political activist type later in his life. But early on, he was a huge figure in cognitive psychology. So cognitive psychology took over because of advances in these areas. And really, cognitive psychology is an in-depth, systematic, scientific study of human mental processing. And we use, definitely in the 1960s, we use the computer kind of as a metaphor for how we understood the human mind. So uh, memory, you know, memories are stored. They're stored in my mind kind of like files are stored on your hard drive. Um, I can pull files up and operate on them in my mind, kind of like I've got a document open on my computer and I can save it and override it, right? Um, it takes time for things to process on a computer, just like it takes time for me to work through a math problem. So there are all these parallels between computer functioning and human um, mental processing, and that's a big thing that happened in the cognitive revolution. It was good for us to have a specific physical uh, piece of technology that we designed and understood that allowed us to kind of understand our own mental processing as well. Now, really quickly, um, we're going to go through some of these more modern areas of psychology. We've touched on some stuff that happened in the 19th and 20th century, and now I want to go over really where psychology is right now. So one big area of psychology is something called biopsychology. There are a lot of different areas of research within this, but a lot of it has to do with um, the effects of drugs on behavior um, neurodevelopment, uh, plasticity of the nervous system, so how your neurons branch out or how they're pruned over time, um, how things like um, playing football, for instance, creates things like CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, how it shears off neurons and how it damages your brain and how that has long-term impact. Um, the biological correlates of psychological disorders. So it's, it's really taking a lot of the things that psychologists have studied for a long time and trying to find some um, biological corollary to it so that we can usually create treatments for whatever we're studying. Another area, and this is a very old one, but it's still very very relevant and it's still a big part of what we study in modern psychology is the area of sensation and perception. Now there's an entire section that we're going to go over sensation and perception, but I'll boil it down really quick for you. Sensation and perception are two different processes. Sensation is on the front end, so it's like somebody touching my skin, right? I have a sensation, there's a physical act on my uh, skin's receptors. That is transduced Basically, that physical um, act is transduced, it's converted into neuronal firing, different patterns of neuronal firing, which is then sent to, you know, it's my brain. So all this is happening in my brain. And then I have a perception of what's happening. So there's a disconnect between the physical reality of the world and then my brain making sense and then reconstructing this world. Um, there is a movie that's, probably like the late 1990s um, called The Matrix. And it, it's a good kind of analog to some of the things we talk about in sensation and perception. This idea that in any given moment, we are not really experiencing the true world. What we're experiencing is our brain's reconstruction of the world we're living in. And that is not science fiction. That's not philosophizing. That's just the real life scientific truth of it. You are experiencing a world that your brain has created based on input from your senses. So just wrap your minds around that. So that's the area of sensation and perception. Another big area is developmental psychology. So this is something that a lot of people find intrinsically interesting. Um, this gentleman right here is Jean Piaget. Um, he's a famous developmental psychologist. His ideas are a little bit out of vogue now. When we get into developmental psychology, we'll talk about more modern ideas. But he was very um, instrumental in creating this field of study. 
basically it's what it sounds like. It's childhood through the rest of your life. How does our mind develop? How do our behaviors change? How do we develop these cognitive and social skills? Um, and there is actually a fairly predictable pattern for normal human development that we can pinpoint and we can map out. And everyone doesn't follow it precisely in that there is some variability in when specific milestones occur, but they all happen in a predictable pattern, almost lockstep. So that's a very fascinating area. Um, this figure over here, you don't really need to pay attention to very much, but there's a huge area of study called personality psychology where we try to understand basically individual differences that lead to predictable thought patterns and predictable behaviors. Um, a simple version of this is the differentiation between introverts and extroverts. Now, most modern personality psychologists think of all of these things existing on a continuum, not that you're an introvert or you're an extrovert, but that you have two ends of a spectrum and people are on some point on that spectrum. So me, for instance, I'm very much an introvert, but the thing that even makes it more interesting is that personality types can behave in different ways depending on the context. So I'm, you know, right now I'm acting as a college professor. You know, I can stand up in front of large groups of people and behave in ways that are kind of inconsistent with what you might think of as an introvert. Um, but my core kind of resting state is very much an introvert. I would prefer to be in my office, to read a book, to, to think. I mean, that's kind of who I am. And I, I gather, I gain, um, kind of, I'm energized by that. I'm fulfilled by living that way. So personality psychology is our way of figuring out these core individual differences in behavior. And uh, we'll spend a lot of time on personality psychology this semester as well. Social psychology, you've already been introduced to a little bit, and that was the Milgram video that I uh, put up on Canvas a while ago. Social psychology is basically the study of how the situation, the context a person is living in, can shape their behavior and their thoughts. So you can kind of compare that in a way to personality psychology. Personality psychology is mostly about the individual's predisposition to behave a specific way. I'm an introvert, therefore I behave in introverted ways. Social psychology is taking the individual and putting them in specific situations and seeing how the context of the situation shapes behavior. A very easy to think of example of this is peer pressure. You might behave in a specific way all the time when you're by yourself. But if you're with a group of people, the social situation has changed and therefore your behavior might change as a result. So the situation has a huge impact on our behavior and social psychology is an area where we can study that. Clinical psychology is us basically studying psychological disorders. Again, we'll spend a lot of time on this. Um, but it's not just the study of the psychological disorders because although those are interesting in their own right, really what clinical psychology is focused on is taking whatever the, the challenges are for this specific subtype of psychological disorder and figuring out productive ways to help that individual. So a lot of the stuff that we do now is in the area of cognitive behavioral therapy, sometimes shortened to CBT. Um, and it's a combination of therapeutic approaches, very cognitive focused, hence the name, and some pairing with medication. So those two things typically take a, the most effective pairing to dealing with most psychological disorders. And there are a host of different psychological disorders. There are some um, misunderstandings about some of them, and we're going to go over that a lot. That'll be later on in the semester. And then to wrap up here, um, here are three, uh, I would say, very recent developments in psychology. Industrial organizational psych, also abbreviated as IO psych, is basically taking social psychology and personality psychology and statistical analysis and using 
that research to apply it to how organizations and businesses and industry runs. So think of like personnel selection. You know, how do I have, how do I hire the best person for this job? It's identifying what the skill set of the job is and then evaluating people psychologically to make sure they're a good fit. Um, that's one of the things that IO psychologists do. It's a very lucrative career um, if you're looking into what can I use. I do in psychology that allows me to make a pretty good living. IO is probably for you. Um, sports psychology, again, it's an applied area. It's taking some things about you know performance, motivation, how to reduce anxiety, and using that to increase athletic performance. Um, some of those individuals are clinical psychologists as well. And then forensic psychology, um, most forensic psychologists are clinical psychologists and they are brought into the legal system, sometimes asked to be expert uh, witnesses, provide expert testimony, um, usually to help the jury or the judge make decisions about a person's state of mind, whether or not they are fit to stand trial, those kinds of things. So these are pretty recent developments in psychology, really within the last 20, 30 years. Um, and that kind of rounds out an overview of what psychology is. Let me know what you think about the videos. If you hate them, I won't do them. If you want me to add things, I'll do that. Um, we'll get back into this thing.